We've just crossed the Simpson Desert from Birdsville to Mount Air through the WAA line. That was 600 kilometers of sand driving, up and down dunes, even water crossings over four days. And in this video, we are sitting down and talking you through all our stats, fuel usage, water usage, food prep, sleeping arrangements, and even toilet talk. So get comfy for a long video and let's get right into it now. G'day guys, welcome to Adventuring Pals. A very different episode to here today. We're doing a bit of a summary of our Simpson Desert trip. Uh, see how we all went. Uh, just, just the boys, just the drivers of the cars here today. Me, I'm Elvin of course, you probably know me from my channel. This is another Elvin. <laughs> He's my brother-in-law and there is my father-in-law Nand. Uh, so we're gonna do a breakdown of how we went on the Simpson Desert. Starting with why we did it in the first place, eh? What do you reckon? Yes, um, why? Something that it's an epic thing that we just got to do once in our life, you know. And um, I knew that you'd be down for it, and um, I uh, wanted to do it, try and suggest we try it before mum and dad get too old. Um, unable, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to do for an older person um, if they're not accustomed to that sort of extreme touring. Um, so I had to take my chance, and, and, and um, we did it, and it was great. It was great, yeah. Well, I came along uh, mainly to spend uh, holiday times with my kids and grandkids. That was my main motivation. I never uh, come with bucket into this country, so I don't have any bucket list. <laughs> uh, we of uh, the baby boomer generation, uh, we tend not to have any bucket list <laughs> well, but, but I did it uh, mainly for my wife and their mother put up with a lot to come across spend the wonderful nights and days with our grandkids and kids well I've always wanted to do the Simpson Desert Crossing for a long time since I've been into four-wheel driving since watching four-wheel drive monthly way back in the day and reading the magazines and seeing Ruthie get through it and um, it's something I've always wanted to do Something we couldn't quite do while we were on the road with the caravan, it was just a bit too hard. And our kids are probably a bit too young and being like by ourselves, it's, it's a difficult trip to do by ourselves. So having the support and people to come along with us this time around was a perfect time to do it. And I'm glad we did because I wasn't disappointed. Everything I expected about the Simpson Desert, it was spot on. And uh, except probably the tracks were a lot easier than I had initially expected. Yeah. But apart from that, everything else was, yeah, it was beautiful. Highly recommend to do it. So down to, I guess, the more technical side of getting through the Simpson Desert. Uh, we have our cars or four-wheel drives is what you need, high clearance four-wheel drive. Um, tell us about your car and, and how you drove it and, and how much fuel you used. Yeah, um, I have a 2017 Pajero, Mitsubishi Pajero, not the Sport, um, the original Pajero. And that's the model from where the DPF uh, is uh, introduced. So my car has a DPF. It has a slightly taller uh, diff ratio, I think, um, than the, the models prior. Um, these together mean that the fuel usage is not as, as good, um, particularly if you put bigger tyres on it and all the regular stuff that we tend to do as four drivers. So long story short, 595 kilometres, 120 litres. Um, I still had about 18 litres um, left in the tank um, when I filled up. Um, it was a bit more than I was hoping for. I guess I was hoping for maybe 5 to 10 litres less. Um, my tyre pressures, I realised afterwards, were probably a little less than I could have gotten away with, you know. Um, the cold pressures were down to 14. I should, probably could have had it at um, 16, 18, a bit higher, you know. Um, how that affects fuel, the, the fuel range at that sort of PSR, I'm not sure, but um, the car handled very well. Um, the, I basically did most dunes in four high, um, didn't even need a lot of diffs. Um, I was leading at the front for the hard, uh, harder dunes in the first two days, and that did, did, meant that I'd never stopped before the dunes, so I just kept going, you know. But the, when I was following and I was stopping, waiting for you guys to get over, then I was finding I had to reverse down and go for a second try. And in those instances, low range, really flocked, uh, yeah. were generally what you went to. Okay. How about yourself? Well, um, I have got the smallest car. The old Mitsubishi's we got, but mine is a predecessor of a Giro Sport, the 
Mitsubishi Challenger, uh, 2.5 litre, 140,000 k's. Uh, my Challenger has got 70 litres, so smallest uh, fuel tank, but I took three jerry cans, 20 litres, so in total 60 litres. I only used two of those jerry cans. I come back with, um, in total, 105 litres done at the distance from Birdsville to all the way to Mount Dea. And very happy. I probably had to beg three or four times, mainly because of my negligence of engaging into uh, rear diff lock. And once the rear diff lock is engaged right from the start uh, and is low range, fed low was the best um, to get over. Just those. press it and make sure you're going fast enough and you always got over, right? Eh? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but my vehicle was lightest in terms of um, loading and things like that. What about your tyre pressures? What kind of pressures were you running? You know, I think 17, 18 was my tyre pressure. Okay. Um, and that, you know, I'm you know, very happy with that pressure level and uh, setup of my vehicle and I'll certainly do it again. Nice. Well, myself, I've got the Triton 2020 dual cab. It's a GLS, which only significance of that is it's got the Super Select 2. With a all time, uh, with a full time all wheel drive mode, if, if you need it, and um, I had mine pretty well loaded up to GVM. Uh, so I had 18 psi in, in the rear tyres and about 16 on the front tyres, and that allowed me to just crawl over all the dunes pretty easily, um, except for Big Red, which I had to give a couple of goes at, which we did the previous day before we before we head off into the desert, and we're kind of glad we did because it was uh, a steep learning curve and, and helped us. Um, understand dune driving a bit more because that's something we don't really do a lot even on Gari it's mostly beach driving or inland tracks which is pretty flat so that was good and after that from the actual desert crossing itself I never had to back down and dune and give it another go for the first day I was actually in low range and trying most of the dunes in the third gear low range uh, and then the second day onwards the dunes were a lot easier so I just stayed in high range for most of it but still on the dunes that I had that we could see from the bottom, they were pretty chopped up at the top. I put the rear diff lock on and that just helped me crawl a lot more controlled with a lot less speed up the dunes so that I wouldn't bump around so much with all that weight and the, and the um, rear leaf and the airbags. And now yeah. I, I didn't bend my chassis with the yeah. airbags. The thing is a lot comes down to how you use the airbags. I only had five PSI of pressure in my airbag suspension and that's always been my case. As soon as I go off road, knock it down to five PSI. That's what the boys uh, have advised from airbag man so that's what I follow and I haven't had issues with that yet uh, far as fuel consumption goes same as everybody else we did the 595 596 all k's from Bearsville to Mount there between Phillips and I uh, used 110 liters of diesel which is great because I've got a 135 liter main tank uh, it's a aftermarket long-range fuel tank by Brown and Davis and then I also had a 20 litre jerry can just in case because I wasn't too sure how I'd go for fuel economy. So I think it ends up being about 18.5 or something like that litres per 100k for the, uh, for the desert crossing for me. I feel like um, uh, that, that rear diff thing, you know, like like we were saying, you know, momentum, speed, you know, yeah, sure, but, but, but we weren't smashing it up the dunes no. at any stage, no, you no. know. Um, there was enough speed to get to the top. By the time you're you getting to the top, you're just sort of slowing down like this, you know. Yeah. And then, and that's where the rear diff locks come in. You just keep the right foot planted at the right level, you know. And yeah. If you start stopping, then you stop and you go back. Yeah, there. exactly. Yeah, once you stop, there's no point because you're going uphill in the sand. It's, you you won't ever get going again. <coughs> you, you have to back down and give it another crack. Otherwise, you're going to be digging a bigger hole for you to have to get through and all the cars behind to, ha to have to get through. Um, it's, well, we've talked about fuel, let's talk about the other big thing you have to uh, take with you on the desert, and that's water. Uh, I've got a 60 litre tank that I installed under my tray, and as well as that I had a couple of uh, small jerry and some water bottles. So all up I took about 75, 80 litres of water, but I only used about 40 litres of water on our trip. How about you guys? Yeah, we took uh, 65 litres, I had a 20 litre jerry. And I had opted to take, um, you know, in Woolies you can buy those 5 or 10 litre water bladders. Yeah. Um, and um, I stored it in under, under the third row seat well, a um, few other uh, pockets here and there in the vehicle. Um, some of the bladders have been in the car actually for several months prior without any issue, been on Gary without any issue. Um, so I was confident that they weren't going to burst or anything, and they didn't during the trip. 
Um, and we ended up using 25 litres, something like that, 25, 30 litres. We did have about um, maybe seven litres worth of juices and, you know, yeah. um, other uh, hydration style, you know, um, uh, other sources of hydration that we also used. Yeah. Um, but we still had like 40, 45 litres left. That's yeah. the point, you know. And both me and Elvin, in our cars, there was two adults and two kids. Yeah. You just had the two adults? Yeah, we do it all, but we have to drink a lot of water, especially at night. Um, so I, you know, was worried about water, so I took 75 litres, uh, three 20 litre containers and uh, lots of milk, milk uh, containers, <laughs> juice uh, containers uh, to fill up the space behind the um, uh, front seats on the floor. Uh, Two jerry cans, one either side on the floor sits nicely uh, and quite tightly and not loose. And um, we only used 20 to 25 litres in total in that uh, three nights and four days stretch. And uh, yeah, uh, that was amazing. I still have got the uh, jerry can full still in the car. Uh, and just on the same note, we didn't actually have any showers as such. Um, in our camp anyway, in, in our car, we just used a, a bucket of water and just a wet towel and a, you know, a warm, warm wet towel to wipe down. We were only in the desert for actually three nights. Um, we planned to be in there for four nights, but by the time we got to the Rig Road, right, so I probably should explain our route. Our route was from Birdsville, uh, QAA, down the Knolls, or two friends, then down the Knolls to WAA across until it turns to Rig Road and then back up to... French line from there, and, and then of course that's the way we came out. Because we were only there for three nights, we, we didn't get to the stage where we needed a shower, so just the wet down was good enough for us. Well, the first uh, real bath was in uh, Dalhousie. Dalhousie Springs. Yeah, that, 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 that was, was a nice, a relief, yeah. nice refreshing uh, bath to wipe, wash up all the dirt from the desert. That was like a, a perfect hot tub, wasn't it? Oh, man, it was hot. <laughs> in fact, after a while in there, it was getting a bit too uncomfortable. Yeah, you had to get out just to cool, cool yourself down again. Yeah. There, you know? <laughs> uh, food preparation for this kind of trip, did you? Uh, yeah, food prep. Um, food prep is a big thing, um, and especially when you're going in a group, you know. Um, in a family group like ours, um, it's much easier to share with each other, you know. Um, the family connection is there, you know. But when you're on a trip you have to still cater for you be able to cater for yourself entirely you know yes. um so you can't uh, uh have the situation where one person one one group or one person is expecting that somebody else is going to do all the work for you yeah. so we agreed that we would um prepare our own meals beforehand yeah. um we'd done this in a prior trip uh, uh last year and uh felt it worked really well um, so we pre-cooked a lot of our meals, um, and we took some stuff that we would, uh, cook on the road as well. So we were still cooking stuff on the road, yeah. um, that we had fresh, but a lot of it was reheated meals that we'd already cooked and that we, we, that really worked really well for us. We just chucked them in Chinese containers. Um, none of them split on us, but I know with dad, uh, his situation, it did split. Um, the containers, oh no, you, My, for you, yeah. We, yeah. yeah. Yep, so we did the same thing for the first time really, we sort of pre-made a heap of frozen meals, I think it was about nine or so meals we made, and then all we'd have to do is make rice or pasta or something like that to spread it out a bit more, uh, and we were self-sufficient for our own car, and then we decided that, you know, if at the end of the evening we want to share meals, we'll just have our own meals and then we'll take a bit and share it sort of thing like that, but... Uh, we did mostly of that, and we also obviously had canned tunas and, and canned food, and also I um, got some meat cryovac. My local butcher, Cohen Quality Meats in, in Harvey Bay, they do free cryovac in your, your meats when you buy them. So I went down there, got a heap of stuff done, some lamb steaks and sausages, and I was really keen for the first night in the desert. I saved my lamb steaks until we got to the first night in the desert, and and had a little fire and made them on there, so that, that was really meant for me. Yeah, we're all jealous, mate. You're just like, <laughs> oh, mate, look at this bloody lamb chops. They're so good, man. Oh, yeah, they were good. I did share around a little bit, yeah. just to make them, just enough to make them jealous. Yeah, those uh, those containers, if you pre-cook, uh, you know, like two or three kilos of meat, you make uh, make uh, four or five packs for a couple. That, uh, you know, saves space. My, I got only a 25-litre fridge 
freezer. I ran it as a freezer. Uh, so the, that freezer had uh, stacked containers of cooked curries, literally, yeah. and you know, to five kilos. You still rice. had a lot of room in your esky, uh, in yeah, your fridge. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I had um, actually. It's ideal to have it totally full to use less battery power. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, the only issue I had with our because. We had some sturdier containers that we bought, the reusable ones, but they were a bit too big. They were probably a bit too much food for one sitting, and also just take up that extra bit of room in our freezer because we've got the upright fridge. And even though it's got a fairly large freezer in it, it's not like 25 liters. So we went to some Chinese containers, like just some Chinese takeaway containers, what we're talking about, the plastic stuff you buy from Woolies. And um, they were great when there was chocolate block in the freezer, but as soon as we started using them, there was room enough for them to bounce around a bit on the dunes. and. Uh, and they did not hold up too well. A bit of, you know, frozen in the freezer. The plastic was brittle and they cracked quite easily. But none of our food went bad or anything like that. It was just mostly just the lids split and cracked and, and we couldn't really reuse them, which is a bit of a shame because otherwise when we get to a place where we have time, we can remake some more food and refreeze it. But anyways, that's all right. We have sort of enough food to, for the whole trip. Uh, and we did plan on stopping and, and getting food out where we could, like in Birdsville and Mount there. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was pretty much it for the food prep. Yeah, I think our food situations went well. I think we still have a whole week's worth of um, food still. I in think there. we're all off at dinners. We're running rely on breakfast food, so yeah. might be breakfast out here in the morning. But um, so then once you fed yourself, you need a place to sleep. So let's talk about our sleeping arrangements and how we found that, eh? Yeah, the rooftop tent. Uh, we did rooftop tent. So did you guys, I believe. Yeah. And. Um, since I um, like our last year's trip uh, to Darwin, where that's when we first started the rooftop tent thing. Um, it's once you go there, you, it's hard to go back. It's just you fold it out. It's so easy, quick. So easy. Everything's already in there, ready to go. You know your sleeping gear, your pillow, everything. You know. Um, yeah. We ju we just used the King's Tourer um, fold out rooftop tent. We bought it on the cheap on one of the specials, and after the trip, we'll probably get rid of it for whatever amount we get it f rid of it for. Um, we were considering on uh, sleeping on a ground tent that we'd pitched, um, and those fast frame tents, they're about $500. I'm very glad I didn't go to that route. I think it, you still have to peg them down, it takes time. Yeah. Yeah, we um, obviously use a rooftop tent as well. It's a four person rooftop tent from Cannon Off Road in, in Western Australia, and we've we bought it for this trip initially, and then we, the trip had to get rescheduled because the desert was flooded. But since then, uh, we've used it on Gari a few times and, and, and other um, trips away, and we really love it. And in our rooftop tent, we can put in four pillows and a massive big uh, blanket that will be enough for all four of us in there, and it keeps us nice and toasty. It's a Sherpa blanket, so it's really warm. Even in the cold nights in the desert, we were very comfortable in our rooftop tent under that big blanket. And it all packs away in the rooftop tent, so that's a bonus because you don't have to find somewhere else to put them. Well, my setup is different from you guys. Very different. Um, uh, we don't have luxury of climbing up onto the roof. Uh, uh, we all this. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I slept inside my car, um, which we have done on the trip to Cape York and a uh, trip to Gari. And uh, yeah, both of us uh, managed quite well crawling in. Uh, I, th I think you were definitely warmer than us, eh? Hey? Because the, the yeah. nights got really cold around did, there. Yeah. So yeah, you well, guys, uh, yeah. In the rooftop, in the rooftop tent, even under the blanket, you're right. It took that off, and you, and you knew mm. it was cold. And then when you go outside, it's uh, mm. it's freezing. <laughs> yeah, well, it wasn't that cold inside the car. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, pretty well um, insulated. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Anyway, we managed quite well. Um, just I just have to assist my wife getting in and out, um, using you know a milk crate upside down as a stepping. To get into the car, um, it uses uh, well. It still, uh, retain the uh, the second row seats. Just it's folded down without the headrest. Plywood uh, framework that splits into two halves. Over the top. Uh, we just have to tilt the front seats. We don't have to slide forward, but just tilt it forward to set up my sleeping. So, guys, there I had, I do plan to do a walk around of each car and my car too, which I have never never done yet, uh, of the setup and how it sets up. So you'll see in a lot more detail all that when we do those videos. But talking of cars, did we have any car issues? 
Oh man, issues, issues. Um, so on the actual Simpson Desert um, uh, route, part of the trip, um, the big issue for me was actually the sand flag mounting point. Um, the way the gas fitting works uh, on the particular, it's, like it's like a, yeah, it's yeah. like an airline fitting um, that allows you to quick connect and disconnect. Yeah. And that means that the whole thing spins around, right? And on top of that, the flag's doing this, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I'd mounted it on a flat plate, aluminium plate, that was below the level of the roof racks like this. So a couple things happened. This aluminium plate moved, and this uh, edge there, it wore down a bit okay. of the actual roof rack. So um, on hindsight, yeah, I'd, get, uh, I'd design a much more robust um, mounting mechanism, and I'd probably choose a different... Um, uh, style of um, sand flag based on that bottom attachment. Yeah, right. Well, no, I have got a similar kind of issue on the uh, sand flag attached to the bull bar in front. Um, yeah, we'll have to look into it next time before we go. My other, you know, bigger issue, um, although I'm, uh, battery wiring uh, was professionally done, but um, <laughs> One thing that wasn't professionally done was, uh, or which we, you know, the battery box is nicely strapped, but the battery inside the box wasn't strapped. So when we go up and down, the battery jumped um, inside the box and it uh, cut off the, you know, second breaker. Yeah, so inside his battery box, underneath the lid of it and the inside, he's got a circuit breaker. And when that battery jumped up, it hit that test button on the circuit breaker and it tripped it out. Mm. Which oh. we didn't actually know, because I'd never done his wiring. I didn't know there was a circuit breaker inside the lid. So I didn't even think about it, but I was, there was some funny things happening. There was voltages there, but, and um, the, the DC DC charger was showing input, but it wasn't charging. And mm. I thought maybe we should check the connections. And I think you were checking the connections one morning and, and you saw the breaker was off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My, yeah I actually, I forgot to totally. Um, I also had a few um, uh, battery uh, charging issues. Um, mine was not professionally installed. I um, did a bit of a DIY job at home. Um, on hindsight now, I think I would next time in the future get it done professionally. Um, you see people lo losing cars oh, on yeah. this issue, you know. Um, Long story short, had a 20 amp DC DC charger, nothing wrong with it, right? There was no problems. For this trip, I was worried that um, the battery wouldn't charge itself up enough again. Um, so I bought a 40 amp unit um, and the wiring and everything is different. Mm. Um, the, so I didn't change the wiring uh, gauges around um, and some one of the connections was a bit loose mm -hmm. and um, and he didn't have a fuse protecting it either. So yeah, that, so could have been yeah, it could have, could have been really bad actually. Could have been, yeah. Um, well, we but we picked up on it um, uh, and um, we sorted it out. Um, Lucky there's a wood. Sparky in the family, hey? <laughs> That's me. Um, apart from that, yeah, me, myself, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have any issues with the vehicle touch wood just yet. Um, still a long way from home, but everything's working all right. I, I actually was about to buy one of the cheap sand flags and then. As I was asking the shop assistant, a, a guy overheard me and goes, mate, don't buy these sand flags. Go and get yourself a Bush Ranger one. And I'm like, oh yeah, why is that? He goes, these ones are useless. I've, I've, I've done a lot of sand driving. I, I, he's a, he said he worked in four wheel drive media. And he goes, the Bush Rangers, if you're gonna get one, just get that and be done with it. I think I'm gonna go buy one next time. Yeah, so I, I uh, didn't get the cheap one and I got the Bush Ranger one and I'm glad I did. It's been a really good, unit for me it doesn't have the airline disconnect and it's just got a a stud the and pin. it sleeves over it and there's a little pin there that that um holds it in and it's, it's worked beautifully easy to take in and on and off uh and yeah and then the everything worked good everything worked as it should so far the battery the um dc dc charger um yeah it's i did change my battery actually i changed from 100 amp hour which I've had for about five years to a 200 amp hour one, but that was just so I could mount it on the headboard and, and give myself a bit more space within the canopy itself. So uh, I haven't wanted to change to a 200 amp hour for a while, but that's that's a whole different story again. 
I think I think um that that one uh, minor issue on the trip it seems like 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 now we're talking about it doesn't seem like anything but it's a big issue when you have to stop in June to fix something you know yeah. you feel it you know and and then that's when you think shit man I should have bought the bit of stuff <laughs> yeah yeah um, guys one more topic to talk about and that uh, unpleasant topic but a very necessary topic when you're traveling away for so long and that's uh, how do you manage with toilets. Oh, mate, this is a shitty issue, this one. It is. <laughs> so, um, I believe I chose uh, the same thing as Dad. He actually, he sent me a message, a photo. I was like, I'm choosing this. I'm like, all right, we're doing the same, right? And the reason uh, is just one of those fold-out ones, and there's a seat on top, and you can choose to put a bag in it, or if you dig a hole underneath it, it'll just go straight into the hole, right? Um, that's what we did. We didn't use a plastic bag. We just straight into the hole. Now... That it was as opposed to taking the chemical toilet, the porta potty, whatever you want to call it. Um, we own one, um, bulk and space and weight and where to store things is always a, a fine balancing act, and I just couldn't find justify taking it along for that reason, you know. Mm. Well, he mentioned the porta potty and the issues with it. For me, I have a solution for all of those, and that's just chuck it on my on my ute and my tray. Uh, it doesn't takes up space and whatever, but I have got the space there for it. So I, I chose to take the chemical toilet, the potty potty one, the bigger one they have. And I've been dealing with toilet, uh, chemical toilets for a long time now with caravanning. So for me, it's, it's a non-issue. And we have a shower tent on the side of the ute too. So every night I'd set that up, put the toilet in there, the boys, and everyone can use it. And then uh, in the morning, it's one of the last things to get put away. We can do our thing before we hit the road. Well, I followed uh, the book uh, that comes with um, uh, when we buy the uh, Simpson Desert Pass. Yeah. Um, where it says you dig a hole 35 to 50 centimetre in the sand and then you do your business and, and try to burn the paper, which we did. So we didn't have any dramas. I didn't take port a potty either just for the space. I did have the fold out, but I'm not too confident. Uh, in uh, whether the plastic that comes <laughs> with is uh, biodegradable. It does not even say in the label. Yeah. Um, Simpson Desert is very f remote and I guess the chances of something going wrong is no greater than anywhere else but the problem is if something does go wrong the consequences can be dire really. You're out there, you might have traffic going, going past a fair bit but that's still not going to help you if you need emergency uh, or, or you know something bad happens. So for that reason, you have to have a bit of a plan. And um, I myself have got a sat, sat sleeve. So it's a sleeve. You just got an app on your phone. Obviously, you have to do all this prior to going. Uh, got to set it up. And the reason I got it, because I've got the app. My, uh, my wife's got the app. I think he downloaded the app. So we can use any of the phones on my sat sleeve. And that turns that phone into a sat phone. Um, I use that. And uh, we had a ground Charlie, which mm -hmm. is someone back at home who we can contact and let them know. They had a rough out of our plane and we just checked in every night and go hey we've arrived at camp for the night all safe and sound uh, just in case we don't check in then he's got a, a heads up of oh you know oh we probably should contact the local police or something let someone know that these guys are out there and they haven't contacted me when they should have um, because if you wait for the end end of the trip that's like probably four days so you know a lot can happen in that time but um, I think you hired a phone from a sat phone from Mount Dave. We didn't, probably didn't need to, but just for just for a, a backup of the backup. It was, it was funny, wasn't it? They actually needed us to take um, actually, yeah. <laughs> some uh, spares across to Mount Dave from Birdsville. Yeah. Uh, more people come across uh, yeah, exactly. west to east rather than east to west. So, so we, we took we, like five we ended phones. Up with, yeah, we took with five, five sat phones over for, for them to Mount Dave. Uh, and then you had the, his e from the boat, his old boaty. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, when you register your EPUB, you can register up to five vessels and vehicles. Um, and obviously you have to go online to do that. And in that online interface, you can register an event. And so that's what I did. I registered the event for, for those many days that I will be crossing the Simpson Desert in my vehicle. Give the re vehicle registration number. So that's what I did. I took my EPUB, it's still sitting in the car, uh, the bottom of the seat, and uh, yeah, the event has finished. Um, but yeah, you, log, you can uh, log it as an event. But you use it in a, in a life and death situation only. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because once it's activated, you can't 
reverse it. Yeah, and that sends a signal straight to uh, the rescue, pretty much. Mm. Um, it's not it's not something he used to contact someone back home to say you're all right. It's you know you, you use yeah. it when you need to. Um, we did take the kids out of school for this trip. Um, just you have to sometimes, and we don't mind that our kids are only in like from prep to up to grade three. Uh, and um, along the way, Elvin he did a really good job of taking the time out, pulling the kids up, and showing them and teaching them about different things. And and travelling around, you really get a practical sense of the things you learn in a classroom. Yeah, it's very important uh, for us as uh, parents, uh, uh, as families, um, that um, if we're going to, I feel, pull your kids out of school, they've got to continue to be learning, you know. Yeah. And and uh, there's, I don't think you'd find many parents that would dispute that kids aren't learning in an environment like this yeah. they are learning you know uh, that play and learning um, just looking around at the, these rocks one of these rocks is really sh shiny you know that gets the kids interest you know yeah oh that's mica on the rock you know yeah what's mica you can tell them about it teach them about it oh this rock here it's got is granite you know um, so we talked about the rocks out here at Akarula we're at Akarula now uh, we talked about uh, different tree species um, the desert was in wildflower bloom, oh, that was um, so that yeah. took the kids' interest a lot as well. Um, birds and animals, um, you think as a desert environment as having no greenery, no animals, that's completely false, you know, there's lots out there. Yeah, we saw everything from, from massive camels to little insects and lizards and yeah. oh, just amazing mm. wildlife out there, especially now with the, with the rain they've had. Mm. Yeah, we driven through the camel graveyards, uh, oh, know, yes. skeleton after skeleton uh, in one, in one. In the uh, Air Creek bypass, actually yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's so much to learn, and you know, sometimes feel that I should have prepared a lot better. <laughs> uh, my brushed up my knowledge of uh, the nature and the natural history, and uh, astronomy and things like that to point out to the kids. You know, that's, that's, that's yeah, that's one night we got the app out, you know, yeah, the yeah. Stellarium, and we were up there looking up at the stars, you know. Kids loved it, didn't they? Kids loved it. Yeah. Um, anything else to add before we wrap it up? Um, thanks, guys, for joining us <laughs> <laughs> for this epic trip. It was great, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, well, thanks for letting me come along. Uh, you know, um, my worry was that uh, me or my, your mum wouldn't cope, um, but she coped quite well. Uh, she enjoyed, we all enjoyed uh, being with our grandkids, that was the most important thing and still we enjoying and uh, I hope to come back. Yeah, we have to do it again. Can we just do one thing man next time? We'll leave the bloody flies at home. Uh, I didn't bring these guys, it must have been you mate. Well anyway guys, thanks, thank you very much for watching and following along. Hope you guys enjoyed this video and the series of the Simpson Desert Crossing and of course we did Una Data Track after that, Flinders Rangers win. Akarula right now, the North Flinders Ranges. Uh, and um, thank you very much for watching and we'll catch you on the next one. See you guys. Thank you.